Hey, welcome everyone joining us online, outdoor in the courtyard, at CSUB, wherever you're at. So glad you are here for the conclusion of The Blessed Life. Again, I'm just checking. How many of you want to be blessed in this life? Anyone want to be blessed in this life? Yeah, I think, I think we all do. We want a good life. We want a blessed life. It's just maybe what we're thinking about blessing is not what God thinks about blessing. Maybe that blessed life is much different according to the kingdom of God. So in this series, I've kind of been trying to expose to you, explain, teach what it means to be blessed and actually how to get there so you can, not, so you can access the life that actually God wants you to live. He wants to bless you. I just think the route to get to the blessing is much different than maybe what you think is the route to the blessing. So the Bible, so Jesus says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And many of us think like blessing is all about the things we have, the things we like, the stuff we have and how much of it that we have. And, and if you are going to be blessed according to the kingdom, it doesn't mean you don't have things. It just means that's not the avenue. That's not the pathway. That's not how you access the blessed life. It has nothing to do with those, with those things. It's, it's, it's a different kingdom that we need to operate by if you want a blessed life. Now, you can have a blessed life according to, I don't know, what are you, your, your, a different definition, the, the secular, uh, you can have it according to your finances, your health, all these other things. But if you want the blessed life that God offers, there are specific ways that you access that life. And so we talked about sowing and reaping, that idea of giving, you know, it's, it's blessed to give than to receive. That opens up your blessed life. We, we talked about putting God first in every area of your life. Like that opens up the blessing of God in your life. Pastor Sean gave a great word last week. How many of you heard that word? Amen. <laughs> blessed is, is from Psalm chapter one about this, that we're blessed. The ones who do not walk in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but meditate on the word of God day and night. There were like trees planted by streams of water. And because of that, we're bearing fruit in season and everything we do prospers and our leaf doesn't wither. And so there are just some, there are some things I hope that you're seeing this blessed life and maybe even changing your, your, your definition yourself to access the blessed life. And today is another one of those, I don't know, conflicting, contradictory kingdom principles when it comes to the blessing of God and getting the blessing and walking in his blessing. The title of today's message is The Blessing in the Breaking. The Blessing in the the breaking, yes. So today, if you are here, this message is like for anyone who's like feeling the weight of life weighing on you right now. If you feel like you're in the middle of a storm, if you've been questioning or doubting or you're on the verge of giving up, I got good news for you. That breaking you're feeling is not the end of your story. In fact, it might be the very thing God is using to bring you to your greatest blessing. Today, I'm going to show you how to go from breakdown to breakthrough, from pressure to power, from crushing to calling, because you're not only going to survive this, man, you're going to come out on the other side stronger because there's blessing in the breaking. This is a principle all throughout the scripture that we can see. It's a principle that I've seen in my life. There's been so many experiences that I could tell you over and over again that the breaking and the crushing and the pain that produced something that would not have been produced had I not been put through the experience. Probably the greatest example I can give you is, is honestly a compilation of breaking and crushing. I lost my mother, my father, and two of my brothers, all within a short period of time. And this was such a crushing period. Some of you know, some of you walked with me through this, and there was just, I wasn't prepared for the, the experience of being without my mother and my father, and without being, the, the, and, and even the, the way they died, it was very unexpected. Two of them by motor accidents, you guys, and one of them by brain aneurysm, and he's gone. And, and so it was the kind of crushing that makes you feel like, I don't know if this is going to end kind of thing, you know, where you go, why, God? Why this? Why now? And on top of that, like, am I going to see him again even? I don't know about your family, but my family, not all of them know Jesus. Am I going to have an opportunity? Am I going to see him 
again, but it was through this experience, I'm telling you, even in the deepest pain, God was still working. That breaking didn't destroy me. It became the place where I encountered God's comfort and peace like I have never experienced before. I learned that just because I'm grieving doesn't mean joy stops. That through that season, God gave me a deeper understanding of his love, a a, a compassion for other people, a renewed strength that I would not have found any other way. The very thing that seemed to take everything away from me was the very thing that God used to give me something greater. That would not be who I am today had not God produced something in me through the breaking season. You see, the breaking is where God does his best work. We don't grow when things are easy. We grow when, when life is hard, when things are falling apart, when it seems like you're, you're getting crushed. That's when God is doing his deeper work inside of you than you can ever imagine. All throughout the Bible, we see the principle I'm going to share with you today. We see it at work all throughout the Bible and every person that God used greatly. You look at Joseph, betrayed by his own brothers, sold into slavery, falsely accused, and thrown into prison. Everything in his life seemed to break But we can see God was at work in that pit, in that prison. God was positioning him for the palace. What felt like betrayal became the birthplace of his blessing. God uses that breaking to bring Joseph to the very place that he was positioned to save the nations. Your pit is not the end. It's the path to your purpose. There is blessing in the breaking. You see it all throughout. Look at David, you guys. Chose to be king and then hunted by Saul. He's living in caves. He's hiding for his life. It looked like every promise of God had crumbled right before his eyes. But it was in those caves and it was in those breaking periods that God was forming David's heart to be a man after God's own heart. And you might feel like that cave is a place of despair for you, but in reality, it's the training ground for your destiny. Y'all hear me today, okay? There is blessing in the breaking. And if you want the blessed life, I'm telling you, it doesn't happen without the breaking periods of God. God never wastes a pain. He never allows a breaking season without you seeing a blessing on the, other, on the other side. The crushing you're feeling right now, I'm telling you, it's not pointless, okay? The, God is turning pressure into power. The very thing that you want God to remove, listen to me, it may be the very thing that God is using to produce something greater in your life. The reality is, we want the blessing without the breaking. Can I, can, is there another route? Is there another way that I can be I can learn, that I can be produced, that I can be affected. Is there any other way? And, and what I'm telling you today, if you want the blessed life according to the kingdom of God, there is no other route. There is only, the blessing can only come, this blessing can only come through the breaking. It's like A.W. Tozer, he once said this. I love this quote. It's doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. That's a tough word. But it's a true one, you guys. God doesn't shield his people from pain. He leads them through it. The breaking is not to destroy you. It's to develop you. And when you come out on the other side of this, I'm prophesying to you now. You're not just going to be blessed. You're going to be transformed in the name of Jesus. Okay? It's just our mind. What we think about blessing, a lot of times, it's just not what God thinks. And how we get the blessed life is not how God takes us to the blessed life, and produces that inside of us. And that's what we're learning in this series. Let me show you a story where we can see that very clearly in Luke chapter 11, verse 27, 28. Jesus was teaching a bunch about the kingdom of God, and and people are just amazed at his teaching. And this woman in the crowd called out, blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. Let me just pause with me right there for a second, because this woman thought she understood what blessing was. She, she thought that the blessing was about maybe your position or about your proximity or it's about what you're experiencing and receiving. Man, it must be blessed to be that close to Jesus. It must be blessed to be over there, to be in that family, to have that job, to have that. That must be blessed to, 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 to get that. And Jesus quickly corrects her and says, no, 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 no. You got it all wrong. The blessing isn't in knowing me. It's in obeying me. Look what he says. He replied, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. 
The blessing isn't about being close to Jesus physically. It's about being close to Jesus spiritually. Blessing isn't found in position. It's found in obedience. And that's a different perspective. The next time someone asks you in church or somewhere, they're like, hey, how you doing? And you're like, well, I'm blessed. It's a different perspective on what you're saying because what you're saying is I'm hearing the word and obeying it. That's the blessing that God's, God, God says you are blessed when you hear the word and you obey the word. This is what James says in James chapter 1. Verse 22, the half-brother of Jesus was no doubt thinking about Jesus' words when he penned this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. You think you're benefiting because you know Bible or you came to church and you're, some of you are deceiving yourselves. Do what it says. You see, the danger here is in just hearing the word and never doing it, just sitting in church and not in your head and never really applying it to your life on Monday. There is a danger in just receiving but not doing. See, the mark of, write in your notes, the mark of a God-changed heart is that I, back up with me, is that I like God, back up with me, is that, yeah, before you write down the feeling, I thought this was really funny when I was writing the notes out, I was like, I wanted to pause here for a moment because I think some of you think that this is your mark of that God is changing your life that you actually like God now. You know, oh man, I like church now. I like worship now. It makes me feel so good. Didn't used to, that's amazing. I like, I didn't even want anything to do with God. And now I kind of, I include him and I kind of, I like God. No, no, that's, that's not the mark that you like God, that you like worship and you're getting something out of it. You know, that it, it I don't know. Makes you excited or so. You know, recently we got this um, Google review and there's like every now and then, which is cool. I love, the, I love when people review our church and stuff. We have some real good reviews. Every now and then we get some feedback and that's great. It's like fantastic. But, but we got this Google review of someone who was like, hey, came to the church a few times. It was great. It was like four out of five stars. But he's like, but he said, but the worship didn't move me. And I thought to myself, number one, what church did you go to? No, I'm just kidding. But number, but I was like, but I was like, um, I wonder, I wonder if, he ever, if he ever thought the worship was never supposed to be about you. That was a critique on, on the church or the worship? You need to put a mirror in that because that's God's critique on you. It didn't move me. No, no, no. That's actually what God's saying to you, like, are you kidding me? Like, you needed this to move, you, you thought this was about you? Worship ain't about you. This is not about you. This state, like, it's not, it's, it's about him. So, so I think that we, 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 again, get this a little mixed up. I'm the mark of a God-changed life is that I like God. No, 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 it's actually this. Will you feel this? Now write this down. The mark of a God-changed heart is actually, I like God telling me how to live. Come on, somebody. That's what I actually like. I like it when God corrects me. When I get the rod of God's word on my backside, it hurts, but I feel like, thank you, Lord. Now I know, I know. I like it when God corrects me. I like it when God instructs me. I like it when God directs me. I actually don't want to do it my way. I want to seek God's way for my life. I like him telling me how to live. I don't want to live my way. I want God's way. That's the mark of a God-changed heart, that we don't just hear the word. We do what it says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 actually says it like this. I love this verse, verse 13. It says, and we also thank God continually because, he's speaking to this church, in Th Paul, to this church in Thessalonica, when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as just some wisdom and a great message or some inspiration or motivation for you to apply to your life and fix stuff. No, you accepted it as the word of God. That's what you did, as it actually is. The word of God, which is, look what he says, indeed at work in you, who what? And that's the key. When you accept this word and you start acting on it, now it starts working inside of you to produce the fruit it was always intended to. See, knowing informs you, but believing transforms you. There's a difference between knowing the truth and living the truth. Now, there's a benefit to knowing. There is a benefit. There's a benefit to hearing the word. Faith comes by hearing the word, right? So there's a benefit to knowing. God tells Hosea, the prophet, my people perish for lack of what? 
for lack of knowledge. So there's a benefit to knowing. So don't get me wrong, because Jesus even said, blessed are those who what? Who hear the word. And so there's a, there's a partial benefit to hearing. You need to hear it. You do. Now, some of you, what's blocking your blessing is, is you ain't hearing God's word. That might be like, there is no new information for you to obey because you ain't studying it. So you're stuck in one season and God wants so much more for you, but you haven't heard the new word. You haven't studied it yourself for him to speak that word into you for you to actually. So there is a benefit in hearing, but there's a blessing in obeying. So some of you, you're, you're living a benefited life, but God's made you for the blessed life. Okay. So you can know the truth and still live a lie. Believing is what changes everything. Okay, how does this connect to the breaking, though? How does this connect to maybe that season of crushing and pain and grief or loss? So let me ask a question. How does God grow your faith to actually make you bless? How does God do it? Not by testing your knowledge, but by testing your obedience. Yeah. So he doesn't give you a quiz. Listen to me. He gives you a crisis. Write it down like this. Faith isn't tested in comfort. It's proven in crisis. See, what happens in the season of pressure and pain and grief and loss and the breaking and the struggle, so often we start to retreat back from the things that we know God has called us to. We stop believing, we stop obeying, we stop walking by faith, and we become, we start going back to the things that he rescued us from, the habits or the people he rescued us from. He'll give you a crisis to test your faith. This is actually what James, go back now a few verses in James chapter 1, and he says it like this, verse 2. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Listen, you can't ask God for strength and then get mad at God when he sends you a storm to build it. There's purpose in the pressure. The, the trial that you're facing right now is producing something that ease and comfort never could. So he says, let, that, let perseverance Finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's hard to consider it. No one wants to consider it pure joy when you're facing trials, but here's what James is teaching. The trial isn't the enemy. The, the, the pressure, the pain, the loss, that's not the enemy. The trial is actually the tool that God is using to shape your faith. God didn't cause that crisis. He didn't give her cancer. He didn't, take, he didn't cause the evil, but he will never waste it. He will use it to produce in you what he put inside of you. God will use what's testing you to grow what's inside of you. God often breaks us so that he can bless us, and he doesn't enjoy the breaking. He doesn't like breaking us. It's just brokenness is where he finds the space to rebuild us to make something greater. So verse 12 in James chapter 1 says, blessed, here it is. You want the blessed life? Blessed then is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood that test, and I promise you it's a test, maybe no, God didn't cause it, but he's going to use it. It's a test. Blessed then when you feel like you're broken and you're confused and it's being taken from you and you're rejected and you're wounded or maybe you even made the mistake again and again. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life. Let me tell you something. God will take what is crushing you and turn it into what will crown you. So how do you turn the trouble into blessing though? How do we turn the breaking into into blessing, that's really the issue. That's what the issue is here. You know what? One of the things a jeweler does, a jeweler detests like the, the quality of a diamond, a true diamond, he gives it the water test. You ever seen a jeweler do the water test? So the, the, what, if you, only if you have the trained eye can you see a diamond that is actually a fake diamond, like cubic zirconia or something like that. You got this fake diamond, it shines. Some of these diamonds shine brilliantly and almost as brightly as a true diamond, unless you have a trained eye, you really can't know the difference. So what these jewelers will do is put it in a water test. Because when you put a true diamond 
in the water, it shines just as brilliantly and even reflects off the water. You can see even its brilliance affecting the water around it. But if you put a fake diamond in, the brilliance that was there above the water is drowned out underneath the water. You cannot see. You put them together and you could easily see one of them is true and one of them is not. Ladies, when he gives you a diamond right there at the table, take out a glass of water, <laughs> dunk that thing, man. You test that, brother. You seen those things where they do the diamond test like at games? Y'all seen those things though? at these games, these NBA games, they take out the diamond test thing and, and test someone's diamond and it's like fake right there. She took that off, threw it at his face. <laughs> Poor girl, just do the water test. I'm just, just don't get embarrassed in the NBA game, do the water test. Well, so many people though who might be confident of their faith actually find that when it goes under the water of sorrow, under the water of testing, under the water of pressure, under the water of breaking and affliction, it loses all of its brilliance, showing itself to be an imitation. And on the other hand, the true children of God, when they go through the water of pressure, pain, affliction, and breaking, they shine all the brighter. They are a genuine di diamond. So, so what do we do? I mean, I want to teach you today. How do we endure trials then in a way that produces a blessing? Because you're going to go through it. I promise you, you're already going to go through the trial. But how you endure that trial will determine if you get the blessed life or not. Y'all with me today? Okay. Hey, you're going to go through it. Why not just do it God's way and get your blessing for it? You've suffered enough, okay? You're going to suffer anyway. Why don't you get the blessing for it? Okay, so I want to teach you through the word of God how to endure the trial to get your blessing. Every single one of us faces periods of our lives where we want to give up what God has called us to. No one escapes these kinds of seasons. The, the, the temptation to give up doesn't make you less of a Christian. It doesn't make you less of a leader. The temptation to give up doesn't make you less of a husband or a mother or a wife. That temptation to give up does not make you less of a servant of God. The question is, what do you do in the breaking? What do you do in the pressure? One of the characteristics of people that God blesses is that they endure. They never give up. They become mature and complete, lacking nothing. So what should you do when you feel like giving up? The Bible gives us six actions God wants us to take when we feel like giving up. Together, they spell out the word endure. If you're taking some notes with me, that's an acronym today, all right? Endure is what it spells out, all right? Here's where we start with the E, number one. If you want to endure the trial to get your blessing, you have to start right here. You gotta start em embracing God's purpose in the middle of the pain. You have to embrace God's purpose in the middle of your breaking. Did you know we can endure almost anything if you know the purpose behind it? When you don't know the purpose behind the pain, it crushes you so quickly. You collapse when you don't know the purpose. Remember, God wastes Nothing, no pain or trial is wasted with God. The Bible says this about God's purpose behind our problems. Look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, that in all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So we're going to go through that, and you're going through it. Some of you are going through it right now. Look what he says. These have come. Why? Tell us, God, why are they coming? So that the proven genuineness of your faith. That God is, that word prove means to purify or to purge or to refine. God is actually refining you. He's purging things out of you through that trial. The genuineness that your faith would shine brightly under the water or reveal something that you need to check. He says, it would prove the genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. See, when God breaks you, he's not discarding you. He's preparing you. The breaking is what is making room for the blessing, child of God. You got to embrace this. You got to embrace God's theology, God's, God's kingdom principle here. We have to think about this differently. We have to embrace God's purpose behind the breaking because when you don't, if you don't embrace God's purpose in the breaking, I'm telling you, you will be overcome by bitterness. And some of you, you may be right, you may be there or close to that right now because the way that you're thinking about your rejection, your pain, or your loss 
it's, it's not even that anymore. It's, it's the way you're thinking about it that's poisoning your heart. You can see this actually happen to King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. He got into a bad place where he stopped thinking about his life and his challenges the way that God wanted him to think about him, and he got to a really dark place. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2 with me, a couple of verses. He says this, so this is Solomon, the wisest man ever lived. He got to this place, so I hated life. Because what was done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is vanity. It's like striving after the wind. It's all for show. It's all for nothing. Some of you, if you're honest, you might be right there. Were you like, you can't even stand life anymore. What is this about anymore? Why do do I even keep getting up every day? Why do I even try with this marriage? Why do we even? And you're at this dark place because you lost perspective and you're not embracing God's purpose behind the pain. Verse 23, he says, all their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. And I'm not trying to read your mail or anything, but maybe this is speaking to some of you who are having a hard time to sleep by the stress and the anxiety and the pain and your grief and your loss. And look, you have to embrace, if you want the blessing on the other side of the breaking, you got to start embracing God's purpose in this season that you're going through, in the struggle that you're going through. You know, there's this, there was this really cool analogy I saw by one of my pastors I love, one of my mentor pastors. This is, this is a seed. It's actually a pit. It's a peach pit, but the seed's inside of it. But it's a, this, this is a seed. This is a sneaker. These, these are, are valued differently look to Pat differently, but how do you embrace God's purpose? Because I got some soil right here. Now, if I put the seed in the soil, and I got some more soil here, and I'm going to bury that thing because that's what seeds do. None of y'all worried about that. That's just, that's going to produce something in a while. But if I took the sneaker, my Jordans, Well, some of y'all are freaking out right now. So. <laughs> but you didn't freak out when I put the seed in there. What's wrong? You didn't freak out when I put the seed, but, but now when I put the sneaker, because you know that, that if I, it, it, the value in the sneaker is in the external. And it's, it's, it, that it doesn't get dirty, that it doesn't get creased, that, that that's the value is in the external, but the value on the seed is internal. So, so when I do this to the seed, you ain't like, you ain't, you ain't gawking about it. But when I do this to, this to the Jordans, to my sneakers, what? It ruined it. You ruined it. You ruined the sneaker. But what you're realizing, when I did that to the seed, you didn't think twice about it. Because what you realize is what ruined the sneaker only revealed the seed. See, what ruined the sneaker, because its value was all external, only was to reveal the potential inside the seed. So God will actually put you in situations that only in that situation can bring out the potential inside of you. He's not, you're not buried, you're planted. Your value is not in the external. It's not in how clean you are, how, how, how pretty you are. It's not in how, how, how pristine. It's not in how not creased your life is. No, no, no. Your value is on the inside of you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's got things in you that he needs to get out of you. And so he's got to put you through situations that may be dark and hard and difficult and pressured, but in there, the seed is going to form and germinate and produce something so that the seed, look, the seed can become this one day. God is producing something inside of you that what ruined the shoe revealed the potential of the seed. I'm here to tell you today, you are not a shoe. Your value is not on the external. You are a seed. God has put things inside of you. He's put dreams inside of you, gifts inside of you, potential inside of you, greatness inside of you, that the only way that that comes out of you is that there is a breakthrough. This is what Jesus said, right? John chapter 12, 24. Look what Jesus said. He said, 
unless the grain of wheat is buried in the ground, it cannot reproduce. But if it dies, it will produce much fruit. Your faith turns, turns suffering into soil. See, that dirt didn't hurt the seed, it turned into, into a harvest. Come on, somebody, are you with me? So what do we have to do? I have to, I have to embrace this season. It's not hurting me. It's not damaging my worth. That rejection, listen to me, did not ruin you. That mistake you made didn't ruin you. That, that pain did not ruin you. That struggle, that crisis, that loss didn't ruin you. It revealed you. God is revealing things inside of you through it. Things that you thought that weren't there, that are there. He's in the midst of it, giving you comfort and peace through it. But you know what also is there? There are areas of your life that didn't shine as bright as you thought they were. And in that pressure and in the burial, you saw, I need to work on this. This isn't, this isn't supposed to be in my life. This isn't supposed to be here. And if it had not been for the soil of suffering, you would not produce the harvest that God has produced through you, is trying, is trying to produce through you. So how do we get from the, bra- the, the breaking to a breakthrough where there's the blessing on the other end of it? You got to start embracing God's purpose in the middle of your pain. Number two, write this down. Next, you got to nurture your spiritual roots. You got to nurture your spiritual roots. See, the Bible tells us we develop spiritual roots by sinking them into the word of God. One of the things that seed does when it goes into the soil is it starts to break away the outer shell, right? But it starts, the roots start to go down and grab hold. What are you grabbing hold of in your suffering and in your trial and in your testing? What are you trying to grab stability in? Do you, where are you finding your comfort and your peace The Bible says that we need to find our comfort and our peace from the word of God. You know, when Jesus was teaching this principle, he's talking about the seeds and the soils and he scatters the seeds and some of it falls onto fertile soil. This is what Jesus says in Luke chapter 8, 15. He says, the seed in the good earth, these are the good hearts who sees the word of God and hold on no matter what. Come on, that's a word for some of you here today. You need to hold on to the word of God no matter what what the promises of God's word you need to hold on sticking with it until there's a harvest see endurance isn't about how much strength you have it's about how much roots you got in the word how rooted are you in the root of God when you're deeply rooted the storms will shake you but they won't break you you want you want to endure the trial and get to your blessing You you don't just embrace God's purpose in it. You need to nurture the roots in the word of God because circumstances change, public opinion changes, culture changes, but the Bible says God's word lasts forever. And when you put your faith and you build your life on something that doesn't change, it gives you a stability in the middle of your trials. Some of you need to stop putting your trust and hope in those things that do change. And that's what is revealed in these times often. That's what gets revealed when you get planted in your suffering and your breaking and your crisis. What gets revealed often is you were rooted to the wrong things. Things that shook, things that changed, things that got taken away. And thank God that he revealed that because I would have went down with him. Are you with me? I would have I went down with, thank God he revealed it because I need to grab hold of something that doesn't change, his word that lasts forever, and I need to hold on until I get my harvest. I'm preaching better than a lot of your respondent, but I'm going to continue like I'm. <laughs> Number three is to direct your attention on Jesus when you're in the storm and you're in that trial, when you're in the breaking. Fix your focus on Jesus. It's all about where your focus is. And that's why James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials, because it's something you actually have to consider and pre decide before the trial comes. See, joy is a focus before it's a feeling. Some of y'all need to catch that one, okay? Joy is a focus. I need to be considering my trial, my suffering, my pain, my soil, my affliction, my sorrow. I need to be considering this differently if I want to walk through it victoriously. I need to fix my attempt. I need to fix my focus on Jesus. See, when you look at God in the middle of your trial, your, your trials get smaller. And what often happens, man, 
We're, we're so focused on the hardship and on the trial and on the difficulty. And when you do that, the trial gets bigger and your God gets smaller. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us to look only to Jesus. Stop getting distracted. Stop focusing on the wrong things. Look only to Jesus, the one who began our faith and who makes it perfect. It means he's the one who saved you and he's the one who's going to complete you. He's the one who's going to take you through it. Look only to Jesus. He suffered death on the cross. Now look at how Jesus suffered. Look at this. What did he do? He accepted the shame as if it were nothing because of the joy that God put before him. So Jesus endured the cross, listen, by looking beyond it. He wasn't focused on the cross. He saw the joy of the fruit of the cross, which was the salvation of our lives, which caused him to endure the pain and the breaking because of the joy beyond it. You got to direct your attention on Jesus. Fix your focus when you're going through the trial, when you're going through your breaking. If you want the blessing, stay focused. Here's the next point. Number four, use your experience to help others. See, sometimes we experience troubles because God wants us to help to, to use those problems to help others. Like the reason, the whole, one of the reasons why you went through it is that God wants to use you in it. This is actually what Paul experienced in 2 Corinthians 1.6. Look what he says. When we were weighed down with troubles, Paul says, it was actually for your comfort and salvation. This is why we were in trouble, Paul said. We got troubled so that you would be comforted. For when we ourselves are comforted, we're going to certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. See, your scars are your testimony. The places where you've been broken can become the places of someone else's healing. Don't keep your story to yourself. Let God use them to help others experience their own healing. As God comforts you through whatever pain you're experiencing, he's preparing you to comfort others with the very comfort you've been given. In fact, the, the, our greatest life messages always come from our weaknesses, not our strengths. That's what it's going to come from. Often, the, the one experience from your past, that one experience that you always try to hide, that you don't want no one to know, that you don't like talking about, God wants to use that to not only help you grow, but to help others grow too. See, what he's producing inside of you, why that seed has to go into the soil is not just for the benefit of you, but that you could bear fruit that would last to bless others. Remembering how God will use your pain to help others is one of the reasons we endure it in the first place. It's because I know that as I endure this, my children won't have to. Come on, I know that as I embrace this and I endure this, I know what it's going to produce in my marriage. As I embrace it, I know, I know God's going to use me in this to heal somebody else. I'm speaking to someone who went through the divorce, and you don't like talking about it, but other people who have gone through it are going to get healed by your comfort. I'm talking to someone who actually is going through cancer right now, and you don't like it, and you're believing God's best for it, but you have a voice to speak in the middle of it to someone who's going through it. It's going to give them comfort because God is comforting you. I'm talking to someone who's dealt with addiction and alcoholism, and you've been free for a few years now or even a few months, but you have a platform of comfort that God has given you that only you can speak into a life of someone with the same addiction. God wants to use the experience to help others, and this is actually part of the blessing in the breaking, that God wants to use this experience to help others. Here's number five, I gotta hurry. Number five, rely on God's power. Rely. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have, you, it's okay to cry, it's okay to break down, it's okay to need help, it's okay to not be okay. You don't have to figure it all out and endure on your own. God's power is made perfect in your weakness. Colossians 1.11 says that we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have the endurance and patience you need. We need God's power. And honestly, it's, it's, when you come to the end of yourself and you finally admit it, I'm done, is when God can begin. When his power in the middle of your weakness can begin, rely on God's power. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to hold yourself up. You don't have to be strong. What you got to do is admit that you're weak and lean on him. Lastly, number eight, number six, sorry. I got two more, and no, I'm just kidding. Number six, expect God to bless you, church. Expect God to bless you. You know, Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. According to your faith. 
It is impossible to please God without faith. And this is what God is doing in the crisis. This is what God is doing in the breaking. And this is why it's connected to your faith and to your obedience and to your faithfulness. God wants to bless you through it, but he cannot bless you if you don't have faith. Faith is expecting God to do something in your life. You get to choose how much God helps you through the difficult times. If you expect him to, I promise you he will. Hebrews 10, 36, it says, Patient endurance is what you need now, so that you will continue to do God's will. Let me time out right there. Because of the trouble, the challenge, because of the breaking and the pain, Many of you have been tempted and tested to stop doing what God has told you to do. You stop giving like you, he told you to give, serving like he told you to give. You started falling back on old habits and old relationships. And, but patient endurance is what you need now. You need to endure so that you'll continue to do what God wants you to do in it. Then you will receive all that God has promised. What are, you, what are you facing today? What breaking are you going through? The blessing isn't just on the other side. It's in the breaking itself. When you endure, when you lean on God's power, when you trust in his purpose and his process, the breaking becomes the very place where God blesses you. The blessing isn't found in what you avoid. It's found in what you endure. Jeremiah 17, 17. says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is not in the external. Listen to me, it's not in to how good things are, how good I have it, how good it looks. The circumstances are favorable. My confidence is not in the external. I, my trust is in the Lord, and my confidence is in Him. This is the blessed life. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.